Luis Alfredo Garavito Cubillos was born on January the 25th, 1957. He was also known as La Bestia, or The Beast. He was a Colombian serial killer, sex offender, pedophile, and necrophile. In October 1999, he confessed to committing the rape, torture, mutilation, and murder of 147 minors, predominantly young men and boys in the western Colombian region beginning a series of torture rapes on minors aged 6 to 16 in the autumn of 1980. Garavito was estimated to have raped and tortured a minimum of 200 minors before committing the rape, torture, mutilation, and murder of an additional 189 minors in Colombia from October the 4th, 1992 to April the 21st, 1999, and a further four murders in Ecuador during the summer of 1998. Apprehended on April the 22nd, 1999 for the attempted rape of 12-year-old John Ivan Sabogol, Garavito was held under suspicion for several months until he confessed on October the 28th, 1999. The court ruled that Garavito should serve sentences totaling 1,853 years and nine days in jail. Between his Colombian and Ecuadorian victims, Garavito is confirmed to have murdered at least 193 minors in total, making him the most prolific serial killer in modern history. If his 2003 confession is to be believed, his murders of 23 minors and 5 adults would raise his murder victim count to 221. Garavito was born in Genova, Quindío on January 25, 1957 to Manuel Antonio Garavito and Rosa Delia Cubujos, the eldest son and second child of seven siblings. He had three brothers and three sisters. Garavito alleged his father to be an adulterous, drunken, macho, very strict, and often physically and emotionally abusive to him throughout his childhood, and further described his mother as a violent woman, who showed him little affection and care as a child. Due to the ongoing armed conflict in Colombia at the time, the family relocated to Ceylon Vela del Caco in the north of the department before Garavito entered primary school. As a result of his father's drinking and extramarital affairs and his mother's aggressive temperament, they frequently fought verbally and physically in the presence of their children, whom they largely neglected, later remarking that he had the misfortune of being in a family that spent most of its time arguing, fighting, and throwing words of great caliber. He recalled being strapped to a tree at the age of six or seven and beaten with a machete case by his father after attempting to defend his mother, whom Manuel was known to beat in pregnancy. Because of the spontaneous nature of the physical abuse, the children often hid upon their father's return home from work. Sleeping in the same bed as his father, Garavito also alleged he may have been fondled on one occasion from a vague memory. Garavito was belittled as an imbecile, a bastard, and other pejoratives by his father, whom he claimed never had a good word for him, solely bringing his son with him for work-related purposes and to run errands. Attending the Simon Balavar School, he was reportedly enthusiastic, collaborative, and cheerful, but gradually became shy and reserved, immediately becoming the recipient of frequent ridicule among classmates. Garavito's teachers noted his desire to learn conflicted with his extreme frustration with the inability to understand subjects. Nicknamed Garabeto, meaning a squiggle, for his glasses and timid nature by peers, Garavito was insecure of his glasses and eventually preferred playing alone at recess. Developing an inferiority complex and reacting violently in response to frequent taunting by students who chased and mocked him by screaming squiggle. Despite the frequent ostracizing and aggressive conflicts, his teachers made no attempts to stop the bullying. This distressed Garavito, who accumulated resentment towards his belittling father and envy towards peers from stable homes. In 1968, he left school in the fifth grade due to poor memory and his father's insistence on making money to sustain the family. This dismayed Garavito, who was also forbidden to have friends or a girlfriend by his father. Shortly thereafter, in 1969, Garavito was the subject of an extensive physical and sexual abuse by a local drugstore owner and neighbor on his father's visits to the store for Garavito's vaccinations. The neighbor, who was a close friend of his father's, had allegedly bound Garavito to a bed before sexually assaulting him and proceeding to burn him with a candle, cut him with a razor blade, and bite his genitals and buttocks on several occasions during these incidents of molestation. Following the first incident of abuse, Garavito allegedly killed and dissected two birds in frustration, which prompted him to feel remorse and shame shortly thereafter. 
After stoning the birds, Gedervito began suggesting to his younger brothers and sisters that they sleep with him naked in their shared bed. He then sexually fondled his younger siblings as they slept on multiple occasions after removing their clothes. Gedervito also alleged he molested a six-year-old boy. According to those who knew him, Gedevito became very withdrawn, extremely aggressive, and ready to take revenge on the world. The neighbor's sexual abuse, which rendered him sexually impotent and permanently unable to ejaculate properly, ended after the family's relocation to Trujillo in 1971. Believing that his father and family would not feel concern or believe him, Gadavito chose to hide his sexual abuse experiences. Soon after arriving in Trujillo, he was shown heterosexual pornography by another neighboring family friend. Because Gadavito responded with disgust, the neighbor beat him into the undergrowth before raping him. In 1972, Gedevito aggressively and repeatedly attempted to initiate sexual relations with women as a 15-year-old youth, but his advances towards them were consistently rejected. Through various alcoholic family members, Gedevito accessed alcoholic drinks and developed an addiction. A rebellious young man, Gedevito was briefly evicted in 1972 after being caught by his mother attempting to rape a 5-year-old boy, and again in 1973 following an attempted sexual assault on a 6-year-old boy at a train station in Bogota. The boy screamed, which alerted the authorities to arrest Garavito, who stated he only wanted to lightly molest the child in response to an attempted rape charge. Following the later incident, Garavito was reprimanded by his father, Manuel, for not choosing a woman to sexually assault instead of a young boy. With Garavito's homosexuality causing frequent arguments between him and his father, Manuel, he was evicted for the final time for homosexual behavior. As a young man, Gedevito started working as an assistant at a compensation fund and later in a chain of stores. Despite his newfound career, he began to have problems with his co-workers, clients, and bosses which gradually escalated into physical altercations. After losing his job, Gedevito worked as a street vendor who sold religious icons and a migrant worker, developing primarily platonic relationships with various women over the course of his adulthood. In 1973, he began work on a coffee plantation as a youth in Trujillo first falling in love with a school teacher and single mother named Luz Mary Ocampo Orozco, who he later attended weekly mass services with. Many of the women he befriended had children whom Gedevito reportedly nurtured as if they were his own children, in addition to being a loving boyfriend when he was sober. His companions likewise described him to be amicable, despite his notably violent temper and occasional drunken stage in which he vowed to murder his father. While drunk, Gadavito, an increasingly jealous and controlling partner in relationships, was also prone to physically abusing his girlfriends over insignificant problems if there were any at all. As a result, he often found himself the subject of town gossip and frequent evictions by his female partners in later life. Gadavito suffered symptoms of psychosis, paranoia, and depression, and began compulsively molesting both female and male children, developing an almost exclusive preference for pubescent boys. Due to depression and suicidal feelings related to his lack of achievement, he expressed desire to start a family. When drunk, Gadavito insisted on having sexual intercourse with his female partners. Despite this, he suffered from frequent erectile dysfunction which caused him extreme grief, often prompting him to enter rants concerning his hatred for his family to them. Gadavito gradually developed alcoholism and began participating in Alcoholics Anonymous meetings in 1978. Gedevito also converted to the Pentecostal faith and worked as a store clerk, where he had again met his first girlfriend, Luz Mary. Drifting from his family, he was only close to his older sister, Esther, who avoided him due to his alcoholism. Gedevito also held resentment towards younger siblings for defending their father, who he felt had largely favored them in childhood. Relocating to the town of Armenia, Gedevito acquired a new job at a local bakery. Following his frequent attendance of local church service in which he remorsefully beat his chest during prayer, Gervito attended Alcoholics Anonymous meetings and occasionally visited psychiatrists before ending his day by frequenting Valencia Park to procure the services of child prostitutes. After allegedly provoking a fight with his co-worker, Gervito's employment at the bakery was terminated. He subsequently attempted suicide. Following this failed attempt, Gervito sought psychiatric care at San Juan de Dios Hospital and was repeatedly hospitalized throughout the spring of 1980, where he expressed a desire to die over a belief that his life was worth nothing. He was primarily treated for his diagnosed depression in spite of evident psychosis and bulimia. He was, however, prescribed antipsychotic medication. Intent on being truthful with his psychiatrist, Garavito stated he wanted to have children, before misdirecting this statement into implying he wanted to start a family. Fearful of consequences, Garavito chose not to inform the psychiatrist of his pedophilia or his sexual impotence with female partners. Gedevito later obtained employment in 1980 at a supermarket in Armenia. B. 
being given two-hour lunch breaks on Thursday and Sunday afternoons. He then began a short-lived relationship with a single mother and beautician named Claudia, whom he described as being the first woman whose company he enjoyed. Claudia soon left Gervito as he apparently could not sustain Claudia's spending habits. Satisfying his sexual desires by binding and raping children during his lunch breaks in neighboring Quimbaya and Falerica, the couple did not engage in intercourse. During this period, Gervito emphasized constant urges to molest children he encountered at work. In the autumn of 1980, he began carrying razor blades, candles, and lighters to facilitate the torture of his victims. In addition, Gervito removed a tooth to be able to bite children more effectively. Following his crimes, he wrote the name of the molested child in the blue book and prayed for them while pacing his room fervently beating his chest while naked in a ritual-like fashion. Gedevito also began compulsively reading the Bible each night, attempting to find an explanation in the book of Psalms for his deviance. He would visit palm readers and other occult practitioners before concluding they also knew little regarding the occult. Afflicted with bouts of depression and guilt from his crimes, Gedevito suffered nightmares about his victims, waking up in tears before entering fits of hysterical laughter as he remembered the pleasure received from their pain. Discovering Adolf Hitler's book Mein Kampf, Gadevito became fond of Hitler upon discovering similarities in their early lives, homosexual experiences, and years spent in vagrancy. The fondness developed into idolization, expressing admiration for Hitler, mass graves of the Holocaust, and stating he liked the concentration camps. On January 25, 1984, Gadevito was housed under psychiatric care for 33 days following a mental breakdown. He was prescribed antipsychotic medication and referred to psychotherapy for his depression. After obtaining a permit to leave on February 28, 1984, Gadevito fled to Pereira where he immediately molested, burned, and bit two children in the sector of Getsemani before leaving their photographs with his older sister. When the children publicly identified him, Gadevito fled the city. He then resumed storing scalpels, candles, and razor blades in plastic bags for future victims. Having molested and tortured more than 100 children by this period, Gadevito was briefly detained for stealing jewelry from a friend. Gadevito also developed an obsession with the Colombian spree killer, Campo Elias Dagado, who murdered his own mother and several others at a Bogota restaurant in December 1986. Gadevito admired the national attention it received and wished to emulate him as he and others noted it on television at a bar. From this point on, Gadevito harbored extensive fantasies of acquiring a machine gun and annihilating his father and family before committing suicide. Holding various murderers in great admiration, Gadevito felt that committing suicide following a mass murder of his family would be an ideal way for him to die. During this period, Gadevito found another girlfriend named Gracilia Zabaleta, a single mother who resided near the local psychiatric centers in which he was committed. After introducing himself, Gadevito casually suggested that she be his permanent companion. Charmed by his confidence, Zabaleta let Gadevito live with her in exchange for providing meals and paying bills. Gadevito was generally absent, but acted as a protective and fatherly figure over the household. Despite this, Zabaleta was wary over Gadevito's alcoholism, which often spurred scandalous and antisocial behavior. Like Luz Mary, Gadevito also would later claim to have loved Zabaleta. After being seen drunk in the company of various pubescent youths of humble appearance by his friends Jario Toro and Ancesar Valencia, Gadevito's companions became aware of their friend's pedestry. Gadevito was not confronted, and most of his male and female acquaintances did not suspect any sexual problems. Starting in 1988, Gadevito began documenting his crimes, keeping trophies from his victims in black cloth suitcases at several females' residences. Between 1980 and 1992, Gadevito was estimated to have raped and tortured a minimum of 200 youths, a period during which he actively spent five years under psychiatric care, having attempted suicide several times. Wherever Gadevito had resided during this time, reports of child molestation in said areas increased dramatically. While operating a Ouija board, Gadevito alleged that he entered a state of psychosis in which the devil had asked whether he would like to serve him. Answering that he would, the devil responded saying, kill, that with killing many things may come. Attempting to commit his first murder on October the 1st, 1992, Gadevito sought a young boy who had been selling sweets and cigars to passerbys. In a state of drunkenness, he lured the youth, who he planned on bringing to a wooded lot, to the Malia Hotel sector in Bolivar, Colombia, before being interrupted and beaten by local police one of whom hit him over the head with a revolver. As Gadevito bled, they then stole 100,000 pesos, a watch, and a ring from him before letting him go from the police station. Gadevito then resolved to commit murder three days later. Committing his first murder of a boy named Juan Carlos on October the 4th, 1992, 
Gadavito began wearing various disguises in order to evade identification and arrest. Known locally as Goofy, a generous man who gave to children in Trujillo, locals went out of their way to keep documents for Gadavito. For years, Gadavito documented his crimes by tickets, receipts, clothes, and identity cards of victims in black cloth suitcases. Gadavito left the suitcases with his sister Esther before giving them to Luz Mary. He also collected their amputated toes before disposing of them for fear that the Colombian National Police's scent dog team may trace them to him. In 1996, Garavito complained to Luz Marie of losing his temporary job as a salesman for air fresheners, begging for a place to stay in exchange for food and financial relief. Wary of Garavito for his alcoholism and temper, she took him in briefly with hesitance. Garavito then suffered a hard fall in the Guacamayas neighborhood of Bogota, breaking his leg in August 1996. Stricken with pain, he resided temporarily with a man before begging his girlfriend Luz Mary to let him stay in her residence again. Restricted to having to use crutches, wear a neck brace, and a cast, Garavito resorted to begging on the streets for the two months he resided with her. Garavito provided for the household by paying for meals and other means, such as bringing a television. He remained hostile, however, and entered a fight with his girlfriend's 15-year-old son for wanting to watch the local news. Luz Mary subsequently evicted Gadavito, who derided her son as disrespectful and rude, and had also damaged a gold chain she had gifted him. Later that year on Christmas Day, Luz Mary received a gift from a visiting friend, which prompted an angry drunken phone call from Gadavito, who stated that he didn't like those f***its. After being informed that he was no longer welcome, Gadavito appeared the next morning shouting obscenities and threats while grabbing at Luz Maria's throat, prompting her and the family to hide in the neighbor's house. After several hours, Gadavito left an apology note asking for her forgiveness and noting his damage to their household. Nicknamed Conflict by locals, Gadavito was frequently seen drunk and drifting from town to town as he outwore his welcome, often due to his domestic disputes with co-workers, abuse of his girlfriends, and general inability to behave normally. His erratic outwore his welcome. His erratic behavior reportedly left him unable to develop meaningful relationships, despite living with two different women in Parida at the time of his arrest. Towards the end of Garavito's crime spree, he drifted to Western Colombia as a homeless drifter. Wary of murdering minors who he felt were much too easy to lure, Garavito developed plans to eventually commit a mass murder in which he would kidnap several adults and murder them as he attracted the attention of journalists, possibly dying in the frenzy. Nevertheless, Gadavito was detained for the attempted sexual assault of 12-year-old John Ivan Sabagul before being able to perform his mass murder on April 22, 1999. A prolific pederast and torturer of youths, Gadavito began to feel apathy with his crimes. On October 4, 1992, he had spotted a 13-year-old boy, Juan Carlos, walking near a bazaar where he had been drinking. According to Gadavito, the reflections of the moonlight had invoked a strange force within him, reminding him of his childhood, which compelled him to murder upon entering a state of rage. He began to follow the child, buying synthetic rope and a butcher's knife on the way, before offering him work for 500 to 1,000 pesos. The boy left the crowded area in Hamundi with Gadavito to go to a remote area near the local railroad, where he was later found with his front teeth knocked out, several cuts to his rectum and throat, and his genitals severed. Waking upon sunrise, Garavito began sobbing as he noted the bloodstains of Carlos on his clothes. On October 10, 1992, Garavito would make the trip to Trujillo to see his sister Esther. Attempting to control his urges by drinking brandy, he began breaking containers in a state of rage after seeing a child pass by. Garavito then murdered 12-year-old Juan Alexander Peranda on the way to his sister's residence while in Tula. He then began to compulsively murder youth, predominantly male and poverty-stricken, and collected their amputated toes. In 1993, Garavito also began cutting into his victim's belly, luring eight youths aged 9 to 11 from school to a nearby wooded lot. Garavito then discarded their amputated toes before murdering Henry Giovanni Garcia, Marco Arillo Castano, Juan David Cardenas, Jamie Orlando Papanian, and three more unidentified children in Southeast Bogota. He then murdered two additional children in the Masai neighborhood before departing for Tula, to Pereira, to Quimbaya, then to Tula again, where he murdered more children, ending his spree in 1993 with the death of 13-year-old Mauricio Mondero Mahai. In early 1994, Garavito would lure a Bogota youth, estimated to be about 12 years old, who had fallen asleep on the bus. After providing him with brandy, Garavito proceeded to strip and bind the boy at a secluded ravine spot in a dazed state before noticing a foul odor. He then let the child go after discovering the source of the odor was a mass grave. Immediately, the child seized the knife, severing Garavito's tendon in his left hand with the weapon before being overpowered and murdered by him. 
On February the 4th, 1994, Garavito would lure 13-year-old Jamie Andres Gonzalez from the Plaza de Bolivar to a sugarcane field shortly after being expelled from a bar that night for complaining of their food. Noting a crucifix in the area, he entered a brief psychosis in which he buried his knife, prayed for forgiveness, retrieved the knife, and returned to his hotel room to chant scripture from the 57th Psalm for several hours until dawn. On January 12, 1997, Gatavito murdered an eight-year-old boy before murdering an additional two minors during this period. The victims were almost exclusively boys, though Gatavito has also been noted by local media to have molested and murdered female victims. In addition to his 172 initial charges of murder, Gatavito also confessed to 28 more murders in 2003, of which five were adults. All adult victims were thought to have been killed to rid Gatavito of potential witnesses rather than to fulfill personal fantasies. Garavito was also said to have operated in Ecuador during the summer of 1998, when he murdered a 14-year-old Abel Gustav Lourdes Valles, a local shoe shiner and paperboy on July 20, 1998, and 12-year-old Jimmy Leonardo Palacios Acanundia in Chon, Ecuador. Both boys were from poor families and disappeared at noon. Garavito was subsequently spotted at an all-girls school in Santo Domingo, Ecuador, before fleeing Ecuadorian authorities who had been setting up an operation to catch him. There, they found two corpses, one of whom was a young girl who had been raped, tortured, murdered, and discarded in similar fashions to that of Garavito's modus operandi. Marked for his thick Colombian accent, locals spotted a foreign drifter begging for money in July and August of that year. In addition, Garavito also stated that he had allegedly committed murders in Venezuela. Garavito was picked up by the local police just a few days later on an unrelated charge of attempted rape against Juan Ivan Sabagul. On April the 22nd, 1999, Garavito was drinking brandy in the evening when he encountered Sabagul selling lottery tickets in the city of Villavincio, introducing himself as Bonifacio Marrera Lescano, a local politician. Garavito proceeded to seize Sabagul with a knife before threatening the child into silence. Pretending to hug Sabagul, Gatavito escorted him into a taxi before forcing him to climb a barbed wire fence that led him to a secluded hillside. At this location, Gatavito proceeded to blind Sabagul by repeatedly screaming, Am I a sadist? He then taunted the child with a blade, shouting various obscenities as he masturbated over him. A homeless 16-year-old had been close enough to hear the struggle between Gatavito and the child. The teen began to curse and throw stones at Gatavito. Gatavito chased the teenager with his dagger. Both the boy and the teen fled to the Rosa Blanca farmhouse located on Lo Coralina in Villa Vicencio, where they were met by a 12-year-old girl. Garavito later reached the farmhouse, aggressively asking the little girl for directions. She directed Garavito into the woods, where he became lost. The police were contacted, resulting in a search. Authorities found Garavito walking out of the woods at approximately 7 p.m. as they urged angry locals not to get involved in the search. He gave them a false ID and claimed to be the politician Luzcano. Despite this, they suspected the man to be Garavito anyways. On July 4, 1999, their suspicions were confirmed. For Colombia's Justice Department, Gatavito's confession was not enough. Gatavito had an eye condition that was rare and only found in men in particular age groups. His glasses were specifically designed for his unique condition. These particular glasses were found at the crime scene. Gatavito also left behind bottles of brandy, his underwear, and his shoes. DNA was found on the victims, along with other items left behind. Police scheduled the entire jail where Gatavito was being detained to get an eye exam the outcome of which would help police pair the glasses to Garavito. By making it mandatory for all prisoners, it reduced Garavito's suspicion and kept him from lying about his eyesight. His height of 5 foot 5 inches and limp were also crucial in connecting him to the investigator's findings. While Garavito was out of his cell, detectives took DNA samples from his pillows and living area. The DNA found on the victims was a match to the DNA found in Garavito's cell. Garavito's confessed to murdering about 140 children and was charged with killing 172 altogether throughout Colombia. He was found guilty on 138 of the 172 counts. The others are ongoing. Garavito was sentenced to 1,853 years and 9 days in prison, the lengthiest sentence in Colombian history. However, Colombian law limits imprisonment to 40 years, and because Garavito helped the police find the victims' bodies, his sentence was further reduced to 22 years. Garavito is currently serving his sentence in a maximum security prison in Nouvelle du Par in the department of El Cesar in Colombia. He is held separately from all other prisoners because it is feared that he would be killed immediately. He will become eligible for parole in 2023, when he has served three-fifths of his sentence. In 2021, a judge blocked a request to release Garavito early due to his good behavior in prison on the grounds that he had not paid a fine for his victims. Garavito remains hopeful, 
having expressed to Colombian Senator Carlos Marino de Caro his apparent plans to enter Colombian Congress, enter the ministry as a Pentecostal pastor, and marry a woman, in rejection of his self-admitted homosexuality, in the hopes that he will be able to help abuse children upon his release. Guerrevito suffers from severe eye cancer which leaves him weak and fatigued, requiring daily blood transfusions. He spends most of his time making handcuffs, earrings, and necklaces in the medical unit of Vela Dupar prison. Many Colombians criticize the possibility of Garavito's release. In recent years, Colombians have increasingly felt that Garavito's sentence was not sufficient punishment for his crimes. Some have argued that he deserves either life in prison or the death penalty, neither of which exist in Colombia. Colombian law had no provisions or method to impose a sentence longer than what Garavito received, which was seen as a deficiency in the law caused by a failure to address the possibility of a serial killer in Colombian society. The law has since increased the maximum penalty for such crimes to 60 years in prison. Journalist Guillermo Preto Lerota interviewed Garavito for a show which was broadcast on June 11, 2006. Lorota mentioned that during the interview, Garavito tried to minimize his actions and expressed intent to start a political career in order to help abuse children. Lorota also described Garavito's conditions in prison and commented that due to good behavior, he could possibly apply for early release within three years. 